Well, hello, my name is Troy Lanigan. I'm president of the Canada Strong and Free Network. I want to welcome you to October's exchange call. First and foremost, we could not do these without sponsorship. So a very special thank you to our sponsor, uh, the Modern Miracle Network. Thank you also to our outstanding panelists uh, who we'll be getting to shortly. Just a couple of quick housekeeping matters. First of all, we are going to let the chat function run today with the usual reminder that anyone posting any rude or objectionable comments, we will remove you. The chat is for commentary and networking. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. That is for questions that our moderator, Danielle, will have a look in as we go. If you put a question in the chat, it will not be answered. Please put it in to the Q&A box. Second, if you have suggestions for future topics, please contact us through our website or email me directly at troy at canadastrongandfree.network. Uh, finally, this Zoom call will be recorded and posted on our website probably about two hours after the call today. So you'll have a chance to forward the link around at that time. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over for the next hour, hour five, we might go a little bit over the top of the hour to our moderator, Daniel Smith, who is president of the Alberta Enterprise Group, but also is a regular moderator and speaker at Canada Strong and Free Events and a very good friend to the movement, of course, as always. Thank you, Danielle, and welcome, and we'll turn it over to you for the next hour. Fantastic. Thank you, Troy. And thank you so much for choosing me to moderate this most excellent panel on a really important topic. I just want to frame it out a bit. I, I know I have a, a graph that I want uh, Zoe to put up just so that we can understand what we're talking about. If you haven't seen the extraordinary price hikes in electricity and natural gas in Europe, we've seen since April, if you can look at this, this uh, little blue bar is a over 100% increase in electricity prices since April. And uh, it even spiked up almost to 200%. And then if you look at the black bar, that's the natural gas increase, almost spiked up to 500% over prices in April. And it's come down, moderated a little bit. So now it's only three times the price. Thanks for that, Zoe. So I just wanted to give you that visual image so that you can understand how quickly prices can change. And we'll, we'll be speaking with a number of panelists to, to try to get to the bottom of what's happening here. There've been a number of events that have stacked up over the last number of weeks and months. I think we began by seeing the cancellation of a major LNG project off uh, Port Saguenay, which would have taken Western gas to our friends in Europe. Europe, of course, is now beginning to not only have the price spikes, but worry about the amount of reliance that they have on Russia and the leverage that the, that dependency might have on uh, on, on being able to, to secure a supply. In addition, last week in the throne speech, Francois Legault announced that he would be banning oil and gas exploration within Quebec. We will get some, uh, some sense of how, uh, how vast the natural gas reserves are in Quebec and what that means, not only from the ability of, of them to be able to be self-sufficient, but the revenues they'll be foregoing and the impact it will have on the rest of the country. In addition, we are about to start the Glasgow summit, the COP26 summit, and our representative from Canada will be none other than Stephen Gilbeau, who, uh, recent, who, who won fame about 20 years ago by scaling the CN Tower in opposition to fossil fuels and was the founder of a Quebec-based group called Equiterre, which is pr principally responsible for the hostility that Quebec faces in, uh, on, on natural gas and uh, development of fossil fuels. So this is going to be the representative for Canada. So with all of this happening in the background, uh, I guess the question will be, where do we go from here? What does it mean, not only for the world, but also for us in Canada when we have these confluence of factors together? Our guests today are Pierre Polyev. He's the MP for Carleton. Eric Duhem, he's leader of a new party called the Conservative Party of Quebec. They didn't exist a year ago. They're now up to 11% in the polls which is higher than the Parti Québécois, so they've clearly tapped into something important there. We've got Dan McTeague, president of Canadians for Affordable Energy, and Chris Tucker is going to give us an American perspective with energy in depth. Now, we were going to start with Eric, but I don't see him on the line here. Am I mistaken on that, Troy or Zoe? We're still waiting for him. Let's begin then. If it, I don't mean to put you on the spot, uh, Mr. Polyev, but I, I think it would be helpful for us to begin with the national perspective, what's happening with the, the COP26 uh, get together, what that means for us, how that's going to frame our discussion and the kind of things that uh, that you're doing to draw attention to it. So Mr. Polyev, why don't you start us off with uh, about five to seven minutes of opening comments? Oh, sorry, uh, Pierre, you've got uh, yourself muted there. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Smith. Uh, great to be with all of you here today. Well, uh, this week uh, we had the unveiling of the costliest cabinet in Canadian history. Uh, Justin Trudeau reaffirmed uh, the disastrous Christia Freeland as Minister of Finance. She, of course, has added hundreds of billions of dollars uh, to Canada's national debt in her very short time as minister. And she has raised the debt limit to, to $1.8 trillion dollars a sum that is almost would almost have been unimaginable uh, only a few years ago when our debt was about $700 billion um, in 2018. In, in other words, she has us on track to triple our national debt. Uh, and um, in the process, uh, massively flood our, our country with cheap cash. Um, in the last year and a half, the, the money supply in Canada has grown by $400 billion, or over 20%, the biggest money supply growth since 1974, when the first Trudeau uh, began the process of bringing us a hyperinflation of 12%. Uh, now, again, uh, we're repeating the same mistake, just as the dog returns to its vomit, the sow returns to her mire, the burned fool's bandaged finger goes wobbling back to the fire. Uh, we are paying our bills with created cash, which in every instance throughout economic history, going back thousands of years, has led to uh, price increases on the population. And we have seen that, of course. Um, we have uh, some specific examples. Uh, of course, chicken prices are up 35% Newfoundland butter, 42% Nova Scotia oranges, 17% in Quebec bacon, 19% in Ontario. Gas prices are up one third. Housing prices up exactly the same, which, by the way, is the single biggest driver of economic inequality. Those with uh, expensive properties have become vastly richer uh, for by doing absolutely nothing other than watching their home prices rise. And those with working class renters uh, are losing the hope that they will ever own a house. Instead, all they get is higher rent to re reimburse our landlords for the higher real estate price uh, of ownership. Um, meanwhile, uh, the government, uh, that's on the demand side. Uh, on the supply side, the government is uh, restricting the supply of the goods and services that, that provide us with our, our survival. Um, they have um, passed Bill C-69, which restricts the ability to produce, uh, not only to build pipelines um, and dig oil sands mines, but also to harvest our 1,220 trillion cubic feet of natural gas which would be awfully convenient right about now as prices soar. Um, and uh, to get uh, our oil to market, which would boost the value of our dollar in there and thereby the purchasing power of Canadians, thus he uh, hedging inflation. Uh, we, of course, cannot do that because Trudeau's killed two of the three major pipelines that were in the works when he took office. And the third one is still not up and running. Uh, so, uh, in other words, they have constrained supply while subsidizing demand, giving us uh, two decade high levels of inflation. And just yesterday, the governor of the Bank of Canada said inflation will be higher for longer. The same governor who said that we would not have inflation, but deflation. And then when inflation appeared, said it would be transitory, has now changed his position again, saying that, in fact, we will have higher for longer inflation. Uh, no surprise to anyone who knows anything about economic history. What's the solution? Stop creating cash. Uh, uh, phase out the deficits that have made that crash creation necessary. So let's get back to normal pre-COVID levels of spending. Eliminate the $100 billion so-called stimulus slush fund that uh, Freeland has budgeted over the next three years. Cut wasteful spending like uh, a billion and a half dollars for the CBC or the billions of dollars going to the so-called infrastructure bank, which is yet to complete a single project. Uh, many more pro uh, uh, wasteful expenditures like this could be eliminated uh, and disciplined, restored to phase out the deficit uh, and, and money printing, printing. Meanwhile, we could unleash the power of free enterprise to increase the supply of goods and services by repealing C-69 to get pipelines built, grant a permit uh, for the tech frontier mine, which was never canceled it just tech front uh, tech resources threw up its hands after years of delay that permit could be either actioned by that company or sold to another one if the if the cabinet would approve it um, let's um, speed up the approval of lng projects so that we can get our newly um, um, more valuable uh, natural gas to our own consumers and to global markets uh, let's pressure our cities to 
uh, more quickly grant uh, building permits for housing so that we can supply our working class with a roof over their heads. Uh, these are the, in, in essence, Ms. Smith, what, we're, what we need to do uh, is make more, cost less with paychecks and not debt. Thank you very much. I like that. Can you uh, maybe comment a little bit about what the what your party's strategy will be going into the COP26 discussions in the in the coming weeks? Well, a couple of things. Uh, we, first of all, uh, we believe that uh, China has to do its part. China is the biggest emitter, uh, and it is uh, its increase in coal-fired electricity means that its emissions will continue to increase. Uh, meanwhile. Um, here in Canada, we've already taken enormous economic sacrifices. So it's important that uh, the, the, the other countries that are actually causing the problem step up to the plate and take on their responsibilities. Uh, secondly, uh, we want Canadian businesses to get credit for the, uh, dis the uh, carbon that they're uh, dis displacing or removing. We have, as you know, the most successful carbon capture and storage program in the world in Western Canada. Uh, we should be getting credit for that, uh, both at home and internationally. Um, finally, I, I, I believe that we should get credit for emissions that we displace by exporting our clean green energy and shutting down foreign uh, coal-fired electricity. We, we could be exporting our natural gas for that purpose, our nuclear through um, the massive uh, uh, uranium de deposits in Saskatchewan uh, and um, our hydro, to northern United States um, coal generated electric to shut down coal generated electricity in, nor in the northern US, all of which should get us credit uh, for um, reducing global emissions. If this is a global problem, as I believe it is, if there's only one atmosphere, then we should um, treat it as such. And we should credit countries that help reduce emissions around the world, not just those who, who, uh, who do so at home. So that, that is a summary of how we and I would approach the forthcoming summit. Fantastic. Thanks so much for those opening comments. And uh, Pierre Polyev, of course, then is the MP for Carleton. I want to move on to a, another political uh, player, Eric Tuami, he's leader of the Conservative Party of Quebec. Before he came on, I did mention that they are polling at 11% in the polls. And I want to get him to frame out uh, what, how we should be looking at the appointment of uh, Stephen Guilbeault, who is the new environment minister. When he was running for election in 2019, he said, quote, I'm going to go to Ottawa and I'm going to work like a madman for the next four years to do everything I can to move the climate agenda and the environmental agenda. Uh, he also uh, created the group Equiterre, which has been in operation in Quebec for 25 years. And when I've spoken with uh, Mr. Duham, uh, it sounds like it has been influential in creating the atmosphere against fossil fuels in Quebec. That's yeah. led to a, 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 a quite a dramatic reversal in what uh, Quebec leader and Premier Francois Legault ran on a few years ago. Maybe explains a little bit of the reason why he's up at 11% in the polls. Mr. Tuem, I'd love to, to get you to frame this out for us and, and some opening comments of five to seven minutes. Thank you very much. Merci, Daniel. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, yes, there's been a many things going on in Quebec. We shouldn't be surprised about Stephen Guilbeault's stand on energy, on environment. I mean, the guy has always been a radical environmental activist. Uh, that's his history. What is surprising these days in Quebec is the premier of Quebec, Francois Legault, that completely flip-flopped and went from a common sense kind of guy, like, just like all of us here, and uh, he's now becoming a Stephen Guilbeault too. And that's what scares me right now. You have to know that uh, Premier Legault, when he was leader of the CAC and running to become premier and leader in the opposition, he wrote his biography called Cap sur un Québec gagnant. And uh, he, he, he had one chapter, one full chapter in his own biography about the importance to uh, exploit gas and oil in Quebec. Uh, his main arguments were very sensible. I mean, he was talking about the fact that we should become the Norway of America. That's how he called us. He said we need to use our energy um, to, to, to subsidize our social programs because we have to be less dependent of the money coming from equalization and Alberta and the rest of Canada. And now he's flip-flopping just as Albertans voted against the equalization uh, formula um, and he's now going to the uh, United Nations conference in a few days in Glasgow, and he wants to be perceived as Mr. Green. So um, 
he, he prorogued the, the National Assembly two weeks ago. And in the opening speech uh, last Tuesday, uh, he came out saying that now he's going to table a bill to forbid any kind of exploration or exploitation of gas and oil in Quebec. He uh, is also currently preparing a settlement with the companies who have already rights in Quebec and who are already exploring and in some few cases exploiting. Um, and he's looking at it and he's saying that it should be a few hundred thousand a few hundred million dollars of compensation that he will need to give those companies for not exploiting our resources. And uh, those companies are now, you know, threatening to sue the government and it could cost uh, a few billion dollars on top of that uh, because of the current action of the Quebec government. So it's a very weird situation. And uh, that, you know, you talked about the fact that the Conservative Party of Quebec is, is, is growing in Quebec, uh, you have to know in the rest of the country that this party was at 1% a year ago, 500 members, we're now 38,000 members, we're the largest parties, party of all the parties in Quebec uh, in terms of membership. We have the most donors of all the oppositions to Francois Legault right now in 2021, and we're polling at 25% in Quebec City and 11% uh, across the province. And uh, that's because there's no opposition right now, uh, a true opposition in the National Assembly. It's true on other issues, but it's also true on natural resources, since the four parties at the National Assembly right now are against exploiting our natural resources, and they're all in favor of depending more and more of the money coming from English Canada through equalization. And, and this, for me, is not, is not sensible. You know, in Quebec, we always like to say that we're more autonomous some of us are even separatists, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, you know, the first autonomy that we should get is financial, and it starts with you know, fulfilling our own needs in terms of energy with the resources that are here. And those who are talking about environment, well, there's uh, l'Association de l'Energie du Québec that came out this week to show how cleaner would be the energy in Quebec if we were digging instead of importing. And it makes, it makes total sense. We have one of the most severe regulation in the world in terms of environment. Uh, we also, uh, you know, when you don't need to carry uh, gas or oil for a few uh, thousand kilometers away and you take it where you live, of course, you're, you're, you're also saving in terms of energy. So it makes much more sense. And even the population is there. I want to tell you that the latest poll by Ipsos showed that 50% of Quebecers would agree to have our gas you know, to, to, to make sure that we exploit our own resources for at least for our need to start with. Uh, and 34% are opposing it. But what is surprising is that currently at the National Assembly, there's 124 members out of 125 that are in, uh, you know, with the 34%, and there's only the one single conservative member that we have who switched from the CAC a few months ago to join the conservatives in the National Assembly, who is supporting uh, the 50, what 50% 50 of the population believes in. So the population is way ahead of politicians on that issue, and hopefully with the the next election next year on October 3rd, we'll have much more members in the National Assembly who will defend common sense in terms of policies in energy or uh, economic uh, common sense in the, in the National Assembly. So those are my opening remarks. There's tons of things I could say about Francois Legault's statement, but it gives you an idea just for, for the introduction of what's going on in La Belle Province. Fantastic. We will uh, we'll talk more about that, but I, I wouldn't mind if you could piece together a couple of dots for us, because when, our, when the Premier of Alberta, Jason Kenney, went and visited Francois Legault, when both of them had first gotten elected, it sounded like they'd come to an agreement that Francois Legault would not stand in the way of export of LNG. And this is a complete reversal. If oh, yeah. it's not on side with the where public opinion is, what changed? What happened? It's a very good question, uh, Danielle, because it's very surprising. For those who don't know that we're talking about gas who would grow through, uh, the corridor is on the north of Quebec. It's not even in urban uh, areas. It's, it's really up north, and it's going through the, uh, the Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean region, and uh, it's called the GNL Project, uh, or GNL Quebec. Um, and what we, we saw there is that the government of Quebec had a deal with Alberta. I remember there was even a meeting between uh, Premier Jason Kenney and Premier Legault um, last year or two years ago, sorry. And um, for some odd reasons, over the summer, in the middle of everyone's holidays, the government of Quebec announced that they flip-flop on that issue, even if 
in the region of the Saguenay Saint Jean, there was social acceptability. We know they always like to say, "Oh, there's no social acceptability," but there was 80 percent of the population of the region concerned that were in favor of the project, and the government flip flopped and uh, is now against that project. $14 billion of investment in the saint lac saint jean region who went away like this. Um, and, and that's also something we don't understand. It's always to please the same environmental lobby and uh, without taking into account the interest of our regions, because when we're importing our energy instead of producing it ourselves, obviously we're sending jobs away we're, we're going to have to pay compensation, as I said, uh, and damages because we're not exploiting and we're not respecting the deals that we already signed. And we're becoming more and more dependent of the rest of Canada. For, for as Quebecer, it's all negative for a strong majority of us. So uh, all of that because of the pressure to look good at the United Nations conference in Glasgow in a few days. This is exactly what's going on right now. It's politics at its worst. And uh, it's coming from a guy who said the exact opposite. And personally, Daniel, I'm like many other Quebecers, we call our, you know, who were, who were in favor of Lego, in favor of the CAC. I voted for him three times. Uh, and, and now we feel betrayed. The guy told us that he would be the champion of energy in Quebec and he's coming Mr. Green who wants to refuse Quebecers to work in that industry, who, who would rather import and send jobs away. It's shameful for many of us. Thank you so much for those comments. We'll get more into the discussion when we get to the panel. That's Eric Tuem, leader of the Conservative Party of Quebec, a brand new political party that is already polling at 11% in the polls. We're going to go now uh, to Dan McTeague, president of Canadians for Affordable Energy. And Dan, I'll just frame this out by, by suggesting that I think as per perhaps uh, because Quebec has such robust hydroelectric resources, I think that they've given the impression to Quebecers that they can make this transition completely off fossil fuels, and it will be seamless, and it will not increase the, the price of, of, uh, of base goods. And so when I showed at the beginning what we're seeing with the escalation of electricity up 100% in about six months, uh, natural gas up 300% in Europe in the last six months, could that happen here? Why don't you frame it out for us? Because when we were talking yesterday, you had me a little bit worried, and I think you're going to get everybody else a little bit worried. Dan, take it away for about five to seven minutes. Uh, Danielle, thanks for having me here, and it's great to be with uh, current, uh, future, and of course ourselves as past representatives. But we all have something in common, and that's the uh, uh, really the sustainability of the country economically, socially, and I think all of those factors are now very much at risk. Uh, something has changed in Canada in the past few weeks, and that has been the reality that energy prices are starting to really bite. Uh, people who could take for granted, uh, you know, uh, as an example, my area, 60 cent a liter gasoline or natural gas prices at all time lows, uh, and who could uh, really rely, as Pierre had said earlier, on the government to look after them during this uh, period of, uh, of uh, pandemic crisis, I think are now starting to recognize that things are not as sweet as they look. And I think that's probably a reason why I think our politicians or political leaders in this country, Pierre being the exception, are not nimble in recognizing the shifting sands. And I think that's perhaps underscored, Danielle, by what we're seeing uh, across uh, the world. China coal prices hit all time highs. Uh, we've seen the same in India, where not just the price, but more importantly, the supply of coal. That's then followed very quickly by natural gas natural gas, coal, and oil all playing interdependently. And we're seeing record prices for uh, these products at a time in which world demand really hasn't come back. What does it mean for Brazil? What does it mean for Germany? What does it mean for the UK where uh, the Glasgow Gab Fest is, under, is, is underway? Well, it means that there's a, a, you know, a really a, a two parallel universes. The one in which those who are pushing the green agenda and the schemes that go with it uh, are realizing that maybe they've gone at this a little too fast and consumers, the people who normally don't have a voice uh, around the world saying, how are we going to make ends meet? I was looking at the cost of fertilizer this morning, uh, nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, it's not being looked at right now, but the cost for, uh, for fertilization, for fertils, fertilizers, fertilizers, sorry, get that out right, uh, has now gone up 300%. What's that going to do for corn uh, and, and other products that are going to be planted next season. What's that going to do for food prices? People are already noticing, and how could they not, uh, when you have extraordinary, unprecedented inflation now in Canada, the things that Pierre had spoken to. And yet you have politicians 
who currently are completely oblivious to this, ignoring this, saying it's not a big deal. We want to get extra brownie points when we go to Glasgow. We saw this uh, uh, just two days ago in British Columbia, where the premier there, apart from the fact there's two carbon taxes, the clean fuel standard, which will be another 16, 17 cents for the rest of the country, on top of the existing scale of our carbon uh, taxes increasing, has now said, I want a hard cap on greenhouse gas emissions. How are we going to explain to people in British Columbia what a fourfold increase in their natural gas prices are going to look like in a year or so from now when those prices go through the roof? Much of what we're seeing right now is artificial. And while some people are saying, well, we have to have this sort of all of these policies, these draconian policies that do not uh, you know, uh, provide the supply that the world is going to need, what they're advocating is, in fact, demand destruction. And that might be a great way of, uh, you know, a, an economic theory. But when you start hurting ordinary people, their ability to make ends meet and their ability for governments to pay off bills and the ability for uh, individuals to be able to uh, keep a job, to uh, keep their homes warm. If people now have to make a decision on natural gas between heating or having warm food or a warm shower, we come to a place in Canada that we have not seen, certainly since 1981. And so my message isn't about doomsday scenarios, because I think that's already starting to take place. What I think we're uh, moving towards in this country is a complete detachment of policies being pursued in Glasgow, which are damaging our economic and possibly our social future. Don't take my word for it. Word for it. Larry Fink of BlackRock said we are heading at $100 barrel oil. We are likely looking at significant social dislocation in the years to come. Dan, I know that you used to be an MP for the Liberals, and there was a period of time where there were, I used to call you blue Liberals, so that you recognized that there was a need for balance and a need to make sure that we could protect the environment and also uh, protect the economy at, this, at the same time. I'm just wondering, are there are there those voices of moderation within the, the Liberal Party? Do we have some reason to think that maybe it's there's, there's a, a sense of pragmatism setting in? No, uh, every one of those Liberal MPs and candidates were, polite, were, were selected uh, for their compliance. They have to mirror the leader. It wasn't like this in the past when we could actually have caucus meetings where you didn't have the whip uh, and uh, officials from the Prime Minister's office uh, taking notes on who was uh, not behaving it correctly. Every party has to have its own discipline. But the, uh, this is not the Liberal Party. This is the first new Democratic Party elected in Canada and has had three terms, three kicks at the can. The two last ones where they very narrowly won because of uh, regional uh, strengths, certainly here where I am in Toronto in, in the GTA. But let me reflect on what I think is happening. Uh, a lot of those people are going to suddenly just develop a spine when they realize that people are coming with their utility bills in hand saying, I can't make ends meet. And by the way, when the Bank of Canada has no choice but to raise interest rates six times over the next year and a half, I'll let Pierre speak to that. Uh, I think you're going to see a big change uh, because the great, uh, the great uh, smokescreen of high uh, housing prices that uh, for many people is a form of wealth may very well disappear, along with uh, the earnings and savings that so many Canadians depend on, uh, complements of the fact that uh, inflation is truly out of control in this country and likely to get worse. All right. So now that everybody has as much anxiety having hear hearing you speak <laughs> as I did yesterday hearing you speak, let's see if things are just as bad south of the border. Now, Chris Tucker is with Energy In Depth as the team lead. He's going to bring us a bit of an American perspective. And Chris, let me just frame this by saying that there was um, a report that was released last week by the Alberta government. It was a public inquiry into the source of funding for environmental groups. And even though it found no evidence of wrongdoing, because we don't uh, have laws against foreign interference interference apparently in our in our politics it, it there's a significant amount of money i think the number is 1.3 billion dollars that comes across the border into canada for a variety of environmental initiatives uh including an anti tar sands campaign that was launched back in 2008 so i, I think we kind of get the sense that we're being targeted but it sounds like there's some problems south of the border too maybe you can uh, you can help us understand the, the context for that uh, in, in, in about five to seven minutes it's chris tucker team lead of energy and depth. Thank you very much. No, and, and it was interesting reference there in terms of, um, you know, how some of the stuff is funded. I feel like as the American on the panel, I should start by saying, I'm sorry. I, we, uh, I apologize <laughs> on behalf of a country, because I feel like uh, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today uh, certainly has been made worse by um, uh, activities that have occurred south of the border uh, in the United States. Of course, you know, I've been coming to, you know, Quebec and Canada in general to talk about oil and gas related issues and energy related issues for over a decade. 
it feels like we're having a lot of the same debates even you know, today that we were having a decade ago, but what's changed is just the scale uh, and volume uh, of funding um, and uh, participation among a lot of the organizations, foundations, activist groups as well, thinking about um, you know, essentially throwing sand in the gears um, and, and stopping responsible resource development from occurring in Canada. And again, you, you sort of that report was interesting coming out of Alberta. There's been some other things as well, trying to put put, put a kind of number on on that in terms of what, what kind of volume we're talking about. And it's you know, it's literally. I mean, I'm not even exaggerating when I say this. I mean, think about like, is it a million? Is it tens of millions? Is hundred? It's literally like hundreds of millions of dollars. You know. Um, and, and a lot of sort of resourcing from a staff standpoint um, to essentially take what's happened in the United States and try to sort of, you know, uh, kind of bring that to, to bear in terms of the Canadian debate. And unfortunately, they've, you know, let's, let's be honest about it. They've had some success. Uh, the, again, a disappointing thing, and there's been some references made to this on this panel already. Um, you know, the, the reality, I mean, it's, it's, you, it was referenced before the situation in Europe right now. That's a, that's a genuine crisis going on in Europe right now. And it's going to get worse. Um, and they're, they're, uh, frankly, there's not a lot of places for politicians to hide. You know, people are, are not stupid. You know, they understand the basics around the supply and demand question. And, and you, know, you, could, you could sort of try to throw a bunch of different excuses out there for why prices have gone up, you know, 10, 30, 40, 50%. It, they're up 6X. I mean, you, you put the chart up there. You, this is insane and, and absolute insanity what's happening in Europe. And it's, it's again, it's specific to natural gas. Oil is a global market. And so we know that, you know, um, that's a little bit different. But then get the gas side is specifically. That is a regional market, all right? And that is not a global market. And when there are uh, disruptions in terms of the supply piece, the price impacts of that are not realized months later. They're realized immediately. And again, we think about natural gas in particular, the, the role it plays in power generation, heating, uh, consumer uh, uh, on the commercial side, on the on the residential side. I mean, th that's a serious, that, that's, that's not just an inconvenience. And again, I just, I feel like the, the, the case for development of resources in Quebec specifically has never been stronger frankly, in the history of, of the province than it is today in the situation that's sort of surrounding us right now um, in terms of even the, the, on the upstream side, the exploration, the technologies that go into this. I mean, you've always sort of been world-class. Canadians have always been world-class as it relates to that, that piece of it. But it just the, the advancement of technology that's happened in terms of water use, in terms of uh, water disposition, in terms of recycling, in terms of the, 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 the carbon capture question, all the stuff that sort of was more uh, prospective back in the day. We were talking about this in, in sort of you know, a uh, uh, future tense, it's all happening right now. And, and again, the, the great news that you have in Quebec, and, and if, if you were to seize on it, was that you have the opportunity to look around all over Canada, all over North America, all over the world, and pick out the best possible technologies that make the most sense for Quebec. And I, I've, always, again, I've always been struck by it. Like you, Quebec is known as, as a province that does engineering really well, right? Important en engineering activities occur in that province. Um, do you think that, I don't know, I just I don't understand how folks there and politicians in particular look at this, the com concept of, of oil and gas development or hydrocarbons development. And then they, they look at that, they don't say, like, you can't do that. You can't figure that out. You can't do that well in world class. You do it, other stuff world class in engineering world. Why can't you do it that way too? And I think, again, I, I just, I, I've been struck by it because it's just, there, there's a disconnect in terms of like what the current debate in terms of how the politicians are talking about it and what actual people are living every day. That disconnect will not be allowed to stand over time. Um, it, eventually, eventually, we will see a reckoning. Uh, I think it's coming quick, and I think it's going to be something that's something we're going to take a look at very closely here, come come this fall, and then obviously into the winter. I think coming out of this, you know, again, um, you know, it, 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 you can't even we we reference climate change, we reference a bunch of other stuff. I mean, the reality is is that it, it, there's no future decarbonization model that works without natural gas being part of that concept, a part of that equation. So, again, like I just feel like that the, the sort of the aperture now that we're dealing with has widened. I think there's more people paying attention to these issues, which is great. But unfortunately, they're paying attention to it because it's having a significant impact and it's only going to get worse. It, it's, it's, it's frankly, I think, a teachable moment for us. I think it's a teachable moment in the sense that we're going to have to have this conversation. It's coming. People, politicians are going to try to sort of obfuscate from the fact that, that, that the, the, the issue that we're talking about right now is, is part of this equation. We can't let that happen. We have to sort of recenter the, the public's debate, uh, public's attention, both, both sides of the border across this continent, and make sure that people understand there is actually a reason for this. We can explain this. And we can explain it in ways that people understand. Um, and there's an actual solution as well, but we need to step up, endorse it. Um, and, and again, show the world that Quebec could, could do this. It's, it's a big boy province, a big girl province. It could stand up, it could do this, it could do it in a world-class way. It just hasn't happened yet. And I feel like the case for why that hasn't happened yet is getting weaker by the second.
So thank you again for having me, by the way. Appreciate Chris, it. Chris, let me let me um, ask you to, to 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 maybe explain what we should be looking for in the U.S. Because while Quebec may be very influenced by what's happening in Europe and the news out of France, I think English-speaking Canada watches a lot of what's happening in the U.S. And last year we saw the collapse of the Texas power grid. Uh, and actually it was Canadian producers who came to the rescue on that. Uh, in addition, we saw the sabotage of the, of, the, of the Eastern pipeline. And so I thought that maybe that gave a little bit of a, a reckoning there, but you still see some of the chaos that's happening in California and their inability to effectively move shipments. And I think a lot of that is coming down to uh, some of the weird rules that they now have on transport trucking. And so I'm wondering what you should be looking at as the pressure point locally, because I think that Canadians, for Canadians, it'll be more real once we start seeing some of that debate develop in the US. What are you watching? Yeah, but I think, again, natural gas prices don't get the same kind of, kind of headlines as, as fuel prices, right? Everyone sort of look, drives back past the fuel station the gas station, they sort of see that prices go up, you know, a couple cents a liter, a couple, you know, whatever, whatever it is. They don't see the natural gas price until it hits their their bill at the end of the month for heating and, and for residential. And again, you see the bill and you don't necessarily know why. Why is that? Uh, is it because of oil company CEOs being bad people or is there something else going on here? Um, and, and again, I think um, it, it suits the politicians to not really have that conversation. We prefer not to be on that terrain and have to answer those things. But the reality is, is I mean, it is a very clear and direct linear path to why your bill is higher. We have to have that conversation. If, if that's okay, by the way, if you're you're willing to 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 pay that couple hundred extra dollars a month for your heating bill, uh, you know, then that, that's cool. But I just I feel like that's not exactly a, a consensus position around this stuff. And again, in the United States, it's it's sort of a strange thing. I mean, when when there's a major pipeline that um, a fuel pipeline that starts in Texas and serves the East Coast, it's called the Colonial Pipeline. There's a, a, a cyber attack essentially on that that pipeline earlier this year. It costs, I mean, literally, like, there's only one pipeline. You, you appreciate it. if you're spending time in, in the Northeast, the United States, New York, New Jersey, Mid-Atlantic area, where's that fuel come from? Well, they don't develop it there. They don't let refineries set up out there. Um, and it all comes from Texas, strangely enough, it, on that pipeline. And that was disrupted for a week. Uh, people lost their damn minds. And I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't blame them. I mean, honestly, at that point, there were shortages, you know, that gas stations were closed. Prices went through the roof. You know, the congressional inquiries were, were held. Everything else, you name it. Um, you felt you felt coming out of that that there was recentering of focus in terms of the importance of infrastructure um, and, and a, a broader version of infrastructure beyond just a bridge or a tunnel that includes pipelines. That's that's part of, that's part of the, what makes America and what makes North America strong, the backbone of, America, uh, of the continent. There there has been more conversation around that, but honestly, the, the, real, the, the reality that we're dealing with. And you mentioned California. I um, mean, you know, California is moving forward very aggressively. Um, to, to try to make it very difficult to develop oil and gas in that state. People don't know about California. It's the fourth largest oil and gas state in the United States. You wouldn't think that, right? But that's a huge part of their economy. Uh, and it all happens in like two counties in, 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 in California. There are you know, folks in, in Sacramento trying to try to push, push that back. But again, like that's going to be a really tough argument to make at this point, at this moment. It, it's different when oil prices are at 35 bucks a barrel. It's, it's whatever your, your uh, energy prices are low, out of sight, out of mind. That's not what we're dealing with today. And again, it's not just a, a minor inconvenience. This is now becoming a situation where it's four, five alarm fire and it's only gonna get worse. The position has become less and less tenable. So what, what to watch for? Yeah, I mean, the gas prices in the United States right now, natural gas up 250% relative to where they were uh, two years ago. Um, it's gonna continue to rise. There's no ceiling on this, by the way. There's no, I mean, straight up. And especially given the supply disruptions we've seen in the United States, it's only going to get it worse. And of course, we are an integrated energy system with Canada in a lot of ways. So everything that sort of, you know, happens here, it's going to sort of reverberate up there as well. And again, it just, it's, again, that's, that's, it's, a, it's a situation we didn't need, to ha it didn't have to happen this way, but it has happened this way. We need to take advantage of it in terms of having that conversation and speaking in terms that people understand and that they, that they could adopt. And frankly, in a way that's actionable in terms of what's happening in the next election, what's happening in terms of policy, we can't lose this as an opportunity. All right. Well, let's see if we can end ultimately on a positive note, but uh, there's a number of questions, uh, Pierre Polyev, MP for Carleton, uh, that are on the national unity front. If I can summarize a few of them, I've got people saying, don't the Eastern Canada, doesn't Quebec and Atlantic Canada understand that it's the failure to develop resources and be in financially independent that is causing the, the unity issues that we have and the backlash in Alberta against equalization. I've got others who want to take another step further, further saying, uh, can Alberta go it alone? 
Um, is there, uh, is, is this going to cause some national unity problems for the, uh, for the federal government? So, so Pierre, you have to take a broad perspective. You've got to, uh, you're right in the capital where you represent, but you also um, are mindful of what's going on in Quebec and you can monitor the French news. You're seeing what's going on in English Canada and you can want to monitor the English news. Give me your sense of how dire we're getting to from a unity perspective. Well, I should, there's a misunderstanding about public opinion in central Canada. The overwhelming majority of central Canadians support pipelines. You wouldn't know that reading the media. You could, I could, I, it's easy to understand why Albertans and Saskatchewanians and others believe that they don't have uh, allies in other parts of the country, because the truth is they don't have allies in the current federal government. But I'll tell you what's really interesting about the liberal communication on pipelines. They don't tell central Canadians that they are against pipelines. They tell central Canadians that they're for pipelines, but golly, gosh, gee, darn, it just doesn't seem to be working out. When Trudeau killed Energy East, he claimed that, <laughs> amazingly, TransCanada had canceled it because oil prices were low that week. <laughs> so a pipeline, which was going to be in the ground and operating for a half century, was allegedly canceled just because prices were low that week. Um, by the way, I don't blame Trudeau for that lie. That's what he does, right? Uh, I blame gutless C the gutless CEO of TransCanada uh, for failing to call out the lie. Mm -hmm. Then when he killed, um, he basically said to Tech Frontier, Tech, tech Resources, um, please pull your application for the $20 billion Tech Frontier mine. Um, and that way I don't even have to bring it to cabinet after it had been approved at all other levels. Uh, tech agreed. Um, and then tech came out and said, oh, we've just decided six days before the cabinet meeting where the decision was going to be made that we're no longer going to go ahead with this project. So again, I blame the gutless corporate executives at tech for not coming out and saying that this project, which had a unanimous support uh, among the uh, neighboring indigenous communities and would have brought $20 billion of economic activity, was the uh, canceled by the by the Trudeau government? Uh, but you know, if 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 corporate executives in the sector are going to be gutless, then Trudeau is going to is going to be able to continue to do this damage cost free. Well, I go around my my riding and tell people that Trudeau is killing pipelines. They say, "Oh well, no, I wasn't at the company that changed its mind." Blah blah blah, and that is how they get out. That's how they get away with it. So frankly, it's time for shareholders and workers and others to tell their executives of these companies to grow a backbone and start fighting. Stop worrying about whether you're going to get an invite to a luncheon at the Rideau Club when you're through Ottawa and start worrying about de developing your business and employing your workers. Whoa, I've got a lot of people saying right on, <laughs> Pierre Paul yet. Let me ask the same question to Eric Duem because I, I have to wonder, Eric, if you're concerned about this bloody mindedness that's now emerging. I've got people who are asking questions. Should we turn off the taps? Someone's saying well, there's a lot of gas that's needed in Ottawa. Maybe we sh that should be the first place to start It's Parliament Hill. And I don't want to turn off the gas or the uh, the oils going to, to my friends like Eric Duhem in, in Quebec. But I hope you can see that there is this kind of bloody mindedness that is now emerging. Yeah. And I wonder what would Quebec do if the t if the if it was reversed? What if Quebec was yeah. Alberta? What would be the response? We, Eric? We, we have to understand the, you know, what's going on in the rest of the country, obviously. And we also saw uh, just before the the, uh, the pandemic, if you recall, when uh, the gas stopped being, you know, uh, sent to Quebec because the Aboriginals were blocking the tracks uh, of the train coming to uh, Quebec, some animals died because they were literally uh, left alone in the cold during the winter and they weren't able to uh, to to you know to have the fuel they needed to uh, to heat the, the the barns. And I mean, it was a disaster in Quebec. And if it had kept going, it would have been even worse. Uh, we are very dependent now from the exterior, and this is one of the risks and the threats that we have also. Um, 
the, it, I'm always, I'm not a centralist and I don't like it when people say, oh, the federal government should intervene and should oblige the pipelines and should do this and should do that. It needs to come from the people. And if you want to impose it, you're, it's just gonna backfire even worse. Uh, if you wanna help us, help the dissidents in Quebec like myself and like the others, but there needs to be a local solution because mm -hmm. our arguments are better. You know, we want to create job. We want, we want a more uh, gr a greener Quebec because that's what it's gonna, it's gonna mean at the end of the day if we exploit our natural resources instead of importing them. And, uh, and we want also to make sure that uh, we, we keep our good reputation for foreign investors because this is at stake as well during this debate right now. And uh, so we, it, we need to, to inform people. And uh, Pierre is right. I mean, the liberals get away with a lot of things and they never come out properly to explain uh, what's their policies on that. And Legault is doing the exact same thing right now in Quebec. He completely flip-flopped uh, without the public on his side, uh, just to, be, you know, to, to see the, uh, the international elite in Glasgow applaud him. Um, and, and it's always the same problem we have. Uh, we can't, you know, people in the regions who support us, they're not very vocal. They don't talk on the radio or TV every day. It's also the, you know, the traditional fight that conservatives are used to in this country, where the, the central elites politically and, uh, and even in the media who uh, have uh, the mic and unfortunately the, the, the workers in the regions, nobody's talking about them and nobody even knows they exist. So um, we have to reverse that trend. We have to do, you know, we have to as Pierre said also, we need a, a plan. We need a some, somehow to fight back for, uh, to, you know, if Quebec is like all the rest of the country. Canada exists and Quebec also because our ancestors developed our resources here. And if, if, we, if we're becoming the first generation who's going to be poorer than our parents, it's because we're stopping to follow the path that our, our ancestors had for centuries. And this needs to stop. We need to be back on the common sense track right now. And, and this is the message I'm spreading. Unfortunately, there's a few people that are spreading it more and more every day. And don't believe that we're a minority. We are the strong majority. We're just not as vocal. Thank you so much for that. So we've got Pierre Polyev saying that the CEOs need to step up. We've got Eric Duhem saying, support the dissidents. I hate to have to call you a dissident, <laughs> <I> Eric, <am. laughs> uh, but, but I'll use your language and maybe see if Dan McTeague can be the, the peacemaker here. How, how do we get to some kind of agreement? It almost seems like we're at a point where it's so polarized. It's uh, if, if everybody is is committed to a net zero target, it seems like what's gaining ground. And I think that we can reach the net zero target with the things that Pierre Polyev was talking about earlier, export of LNG and carbon capture utilization and storage and hydrogen and geothermal. There's all kinds of ways that we can build an electricity system and, a, and a, 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 an energy system that uses those aspects. But that doesn't seem to be a very compelling argument in Quebec. And maybe you can help us bridge the divide, Dan. How, how do we make the argument? Is, is net zero the wrong target? Target. Is it unachievable or is it achievable a different way? What do you think? Very good questions, Danielle. And, you know, I take what my colleagues have said here. I think the focus has to be not so much on the, you know, the verbiage of climate crisis. I know it's a big deal now at CBC. I've done a couple of interviews with them. And of course, it comes up almost every time. We're transitioning to actually an energy crisis. And I think uh, there is also, we can talk about the lack of in, uh, public uh, involvement that uh, Eric had touched on, uh, the, the large voices out there who are concerned, whose ideas are not getting properly represented. But I think all of this really comes real uh, very quickly when we realize that uh, people's biggest concern is their ability to make ends meet. It's a very simple response to what is a growing concern in the country. And it doesn't just stop, obviously, with our inability to afford things. It also spreads over to uh, you know, the country's uh, finances, which are in appalling shape. It spreads over into our inability maybe to make ends meet uh, financially, not just for the, for the federal government, but also for uh, consumers as a whole. So who is going to speak to the emerging real crisis. If it's not going to be the media, it's not going to be the elites, then it's going to have to be us, uh, each and every one of us in our own selective uh, way to be able to bring this kind of argument forward that something is wrong, something has become detached and the reality is compelling people to deal with, well, reality as opposed to aspirational goals. We have no problems with all the technologies out there. Canada is a true leader when it comes to clean energy. I represented a riding 
uh, you know, uh, Pickering, the first nuclear uh, commercial uh, power plants in all of North America, 55 years ago. Hydro, we did it back in the 1910s, 1920s, the big Manic project in Quebec. So I think we need to remind people that there's a lesson here. We're a cold country, uh, but we are the ones that are able to provide a lot of opportunities, not just for ourselves, but for the rest of the world. Let's very proudly to speak to the kind of energy developments that we've had, the technology and the clean menu of opportunities that are there. Let's not fall into the trap of those who are saying, you know, there's a there's a there's a, an extreme idea out there that says the world is coming to an end in 10 years. We heard that 10, 12 years ago. It was wrong then. It's wrong now. Let's be practical. All right. Let me see if uh, Chris Tucker can give us some advice, because I when I read the uh, report uh, looking at the, the funding model and the, the billions, hundreds of millions coming into en uh, environment um, in NGOs, I, I kind of thought we need to develop the same thing on the other side. And that's kind of what I'm hearing each of our previous speakers say is that this is going to require a grassroots movement. And I wonder if you can give us some hope that that movement is already beginning to develop in America and give us some advice about the things that need to be done in order to get the proper messaging out. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, well, I would just say to that, to that, I mean, I think what gives me hope um, is, especially as I think about the Canadian question specifically, uh, is the history of leadership of that country, your country, uh, and across all sorts of different things and out punching your weight in, in, in significant ways all around the global, global, global stage, no matter what, no matter the issue. And I think, again, we think about Quebec and natural gas and, and obviously the prices there and what's going to happen, what's already happening. That's first priority. You got to take good care of folks in your community. But the, the opportunity for Canada to step up and be a leader, especially in terms of LNG, um, in terms of, you know, we think about places around the world like India, you know, that the future of energy and the future of a lot of things is sort of happening right there. All right. That, that's an important place in this world. It will surpass China in terms of being the most populous country over the next two years. Uh, there are 335 million people in India who have no electricity this day, this morning, today. And that's that's a, a position that's untenable. That will have to change. And it's not going to happen with solar panels overnight. All right. Uh, so the question is, are we going to do it with coal? We're going to do it with what, 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 natural gas, with some combination, with renewable? It's, the, the point is that a lot of these things, sort of global trends now, that's going to set the course of history for the next 100 years are happening. Decisions being made right now that will set that course. Mm. Canada has an opportunity to step up and be part of that conversation, supply some of this energy. I mean, it's, it's a country that, as you know, I mean, as you all know, one of the richest countries in terms of resources that exists on planet Earth. Um, and, and again, you guys get to live in one of the prettiest places in the world, but you get to live there because of the resource development piece. All right. Um, it's a sparsely populated country. Um, you know, it, this is a situation where the resources are part of, part of your past, it's a part of your future, and you could do it in a way, you've already proven that you could do it in a way that's cleaner and, and, and more uh, technologically advanced, and frankly, a lot of other countries, including my own. Um, so I don't know, it just seems like to me, if we're going to have this conversation about both, you know, starting local, obviously, that's where it's going to be have important political potency in terms of having this conversation around why these prices are the way they are. But then moving forward, the opportunity here um, is to be the world supplier. Um, and, and to do, do it in a way that is, it could, could achieve a net zero goal, if that's going to be the objective, then why not? Why not do net zero? You know, why not do absolute zero? I mean, you have all these different sort of opportunities here to step up and do that and, and help places around the world that um, are becoming more and more middle class. I mean, this is going to happen. This is, this, this is the story of our time right now. And Canada has the opportunity to be at the center of that. But not with you know, the and I agree with you, Chris. I guess I'm just wondering, where are our billionaires? There's lots of billionaires on the other side wanting to stop fossil fuel development. Are there any places that we can be looking to find the billionaires that will that will support a movement to bring some balance to this discussion? Well, it's a good question. I mean, it was mentioned before, BlackRock and, and Larry Fink, he was actually uh, the chairman of Blair, uh, BlackRock, obviously, been very active on ESG issues, sustainability. But he was, he was quoted this week saying um, this idea that we're going to flip the switch overnight um, and and it, it sort of move, move everything towards sort of this you know overnight net, net zero removals model. It just doesn't work in terms of the, if we think about it holistically around the globe. What's going to be important here in terms of uh, investment, in terms of you know building that pathway for this to sort of stuff to occur. So again, I, I, it's one of those things where it, the, the other side I, again they have a lot of money, uh, they have a lot of organization. I feel like we have more numbers on our side, but to the point that I think Eric made earlier is this, there's a bit of a silent majority situation. I do believe that will change. I think the yellow vest situation in France from a couple of years ago uh, underscored this issue. I think you're going to start, it's going to be that times three this, this winter in, the, in Europe. I think this is a moment here. Um, it, it, you will not be able to look away. We okay. will have to have a conversation. It's an adult conversation. We have to have it. And I think we are on the right side of history in that, in that regard. All and right. It's time to, that, uh, if I could interrupt. Go ahead. Go ahead. Here, yeah. I think if you are a shareholder, 
uh, in these companies and uh, the CEO is gutless, fire him. Fire him at the next uh, shareholder meeting. We don't need any more gutless wonders running our businesses. The, the workers are courageous. They are fighting for their livelihoods. They deserve CEOs that will do the same. All right. Thank you for that. Let me uh, go to, I want to, uh, Tammy Nemeth, I see she was a contributor to the public inquiry, showed a couple of really great reports mapping out where the money is coming from. But she uh, wanted me to pose this question to you, Dan McTeague, uh, saying you may be interested to know there is insufficient supply of fertilizer. Farmers, we know if they had not pre-ordered their fertilizer, cannot buy any because there isn't any. Fertilizer plants in Manitoba and Saskatchewan are sitting idle. Do you know why? I don't know why, but I can only imagine that a lot of this may be the labor issues, but it also has to do with the fact that uh, they may not be able to outcompete American purchasers. We see this time and time and time again. It's propane supplies in 2013. We see the same thing with respect to ethanol mandates in the United States. Canada is getting frozen out because it chooses to do so, and it's victimizing an important uh, area of our economy mess around with the farming community as you have with manufacturing as you have done not we or you but as we've done with the energy oil and gas sector it's a recipe for economic disaster i can hardly wait till christia freeland has to go before the public give her budget and lie through her teeth while the bond rating agencies of this world sort of sit back and say nothing to see here folks there is sooner or later the straw is going to break the camel's back and I think it's going to be fertilizers because it's going to destroy our ability to maintain uh, the thing that we all agree with, the need for good food at a reasonable price. All right, Eric, just wanting you to, to weigh in on these issues as well, just to understand a little bit about where, where you think we can go with net zero. Is there an, an appetite for that? Do you think as well that once we start seeing, as Dan's saying, the, the, the struggles in being able to get the base materials that we need for food production, uh, what, what do you think the consequences of that are, are going to be? Because I see a lot of activism in Quebec. Um, we see uh, tens of thousands of people taking the streets of Montreal for all kinds of reasons. I'm just wondering if, you, if you're beginning to see that, that there is a turning point here. Well, first off, as you know, Quebec has a huge reserve in terms of uh, hydroelectricity. And so when you're talking about low emissions, we always like in Quebec to be very proud and compare that our energy is cleaner than, other, than the competition for electricity, which is true. But it's also true for exploiting our gas and oil industry, because that's the input, that's the energy we're going to use, you know, to dig. And, and uh, they're, they're also always talking about, you know, the fact that the competition is not doing it. They're doing it with other technologies that are much more uh, polluting. So, yes, the, the zero emission is, is a big debate, uh, as it was said earlier. Year. There's also the fact that we've learned from what happened across the world, especially in, in the US and the rest of Canada for, for that kind of, uh, of technology. And now we have, uh, you know, we have the great engineers for, for the dams here in Quebec, and we can use those people who are already in the energy sector for our gas and oil uh, sector. So we have all sorts of reasons to exploit it. And we're also very lucky in Canada, in Quebec, as especially we have tons of resources that are there just to ready to exploit. And a few, you know, even last year, as Pierre mentioned, a, a few minutes ago, you know, we were saying that we can't dig because the prices are low. As you recall, here in Quebec City, we were paying less than a dollar per liter for, for our, our, our oil. Uh, currently, I just went to fuel my car earlier today. It's at a, a close to a dollar and 60 right now in Quebec City. And in some regions of Quebec, it's 175 and we're expecting two dollars a liter by the end of the year. So this is another incentive. I think, uh, you know, that's very concrete and it's not just like the energy bills at the end of the month it's every single time you go at the gas station you see that it's going up like crazy and i think that's also going to help the momentum uh, to grow and the people to realize we need to do something and we, we need to be more independent and lower the cost of energy and lower also the emissions as well i will get you all to make a final closing comment but i noticed that paul stevers is also um, put a, a, a question or a comment on our Q&A session. I, I, I met Paul Stevers. He's a new friend, along with Mark Klippenstein, who's with that Canadian Hydrogen Association. And these are our individuals who identify on the left, identify as uh, as putting the, 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 the demands for reducing greenhouse gases first, but they see that carbon capture utilization and storage and working with the energy industry is the only way to get there. Paul Stevers, if you want to see, he's got a seven-minute animated video 
on climatesan, S-A-N dot org. And what they do is uh, it's uh, combining fossil fuel power plants with carbon capture technology, renewable energy farms, energy storage systems, and direct air capture in order to reach the, the solution. So I'm beginning to see that there are some allies and friends in the traditional environmental movement who are realizing that we need to, to have some pragmatism. Now, I hope that will take over, but I want you guys to end with a note of hope because a lot of people are now having heard all this quite worried about how they're going to prepare for what happens to us if we start seeing the same trends occur in, uh, in, in the, as we get through winter. Let me begin with, with Dan, if you can give some tips and also comment if there's anything that you see that's a positive development that we can build on. Dan McTeague. Uh, thanks, Danielle, and thanks for uh, all the panelists and uh, my, my presence here is uh, very much one of a uh, very humbling experience. But uh, rather than coming down on a down note, I think the reality is that this all this bad news, much of it deliberately engineered uh, by our reliance on you know re, uh, unreliable renewables, uh, is leading to a, a conclusion. I think that many will begin to draw that the status quo is not acceptable. The status quo has been thirty years in the building, in the making, and so for that reason, I believe that political actors, uh, those in media, those who are objective. Uh, you know, you're going to be in a very enviable position in a very short period of time. I think by the end of winter 2022, and certainly throughout 2022, we're going to hear from Canadians in a very, very distinct and very loud voice. It's really up to our political actors to harness that, perhaps change their uh, positions that they only had five or six weeks ago, and to begin to understand that uh, when you look after Canadians and you look after people, they'll look after you at the ballot box. And I think that's where we're heading. Regardless, watch the parties start to change some of their political discourse. I'm confident that's going to happen. Unfortunately, it's taken a lot of pain for uh, our political actors to wake up and smell the coffee. All right, Chris Tucker, give us some hope that uh, whatever activism is happening in the U.S. on the positive side is going to spill across the border. What do, what do you see? Yeah, I just I, I think that sometimes we have a tendency in this business to sort of think about it in terms of, you know, you know, we, we read the, the news and we sort of see what the activists are up to. And we assume that just sort of we see what's on Twitter uh, and we assume that just, that that must be the a representation of where the public is on, on the various issues. Um, and that's not true. Um, and again, I just I feel like it's, it's we have a, a significant part of the population here. Um, that again, it, they don't think about these issues every day, but when they do think about them, they tend, tend, tend to side, come down on our side. They want uh, re reliable energy, they want affordable energy, they want it done the right way, they want it clean. Um, uh, increasingly, they're concerned about climate change. That's, just the, that's what the polling will tell you, straight up. And again, we don't have to necessarily, as industry, uh, you know, as folks that are involved in, on, on the uh, sort of the production side, especially in the distribution side, you know, let's take a back seat on that conversation. Uh, we're going to be part of this conversation. And if they care about climate change and that's an important issue to you, uh, that will be solved not by someone in developing an app in their basement. All right. That, that's going to require big, big type activities that happen on the engineering side, the science side, you know, access to capital, research and development, supply chain, value chain, you name it. And it's big, big companies stepping up and doing important things and working alongside governments. That's the opportunity you guys have as well. Uh, the Canadians writ large and us as a North American energy system that we have, not only in terms of our own population, but globally. Um, and the, the moment of reckoning, as I say, it's coming. So it's, there's no need to predict on this stuff. It's coming. Mm -hmm. We just got to make sure that the, the, the conversation that ensues is framed in the proper way. All right. Uh, Pierre Polyev, I'll ask the question from Valerie Nolan. You've given a pretty big wake up call to the CEOs. She's wondering how can we change things and wake up Canadians? I know you've done just some tremendous videos and thank you so much for educating people about why monetary policy actually matters and interest rate matter, but it, it is difficult to, to get Canadians to act. What, what do you recommend there? How do we wake everybody up? Do I have uh, Pierre? Did I lose Pierre? Yeah, he, he had to drop off, Daniel. Oh, my apologies. You know what? Then let me uh, let me put that uh, that qu that question to Eric to M, uh, because I think it's the it's the same question. Because I th I think it sounds like there's an awakening happening in Quebec, and if we can get that uh, going across the rest of the country, support your efforts, but also add to them. Do, do you have some thoughts? You you've been successful in creating a brand new movement from scratch in a year. How'd you do yeah, it? But, well. It's not me. It's the you know it's the population moving, and there's a there's an incentive right now, and I think it's the price. Unfortunately, uh, I think sometimes you know we need to, to hit the bottom of the can before we go up again, and we're hitting it right now. We we might hit the wall in the next few months uh, by the shortage uh, of resources, by the price.
prices going up the roof, and that's going to put a huge pressure uh, on, on the politicians, on the political class, on our political elites, and, and even in the media. And that's how you know they're going to move towards our ideas. Unfortunately, it's very sad. We're going to get, we're going to have to be a little poorer. And uh, there needs to be also the threat from Alberta with the, the equalization payment. We didn't talk about that issue, but it's 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 also part of the uh, the, the deal with, of what's going on right now. And that kind of pressure, unfortunately, uh, we need to be threatened and we need to see the impact uh, of our, our green policies and how costly they are and how poor we're going to get with them uh, before we react. And that's we're at a crossroad right now. And, and unfortunately, uh, you know, that the, that the fact that we're going to hit the wall might may, might have a lot of people moving towards our ideas in the next few months. Oh, Eric Duman, thank you for that. He's leader of the Conservative Party of Quebec. Pierre Polyev was MP for uh, Carlson. Dan McTeague, president of Canadians for Affordable Energy. And Chris Tucker, team lead of Energy in Depth. It's a bit sobering that we have to suffer through the pain rather than try to avoid it. But uh, that seems to be the unavoidable. The question will be, are we going to be ready for it when it happens? And maybe that'll be the source of another Canada strong and free. Let me hand it back to Troy Lanigan. I'm Danielle Smith, president of the Albert Enterprise Group. Troy, go ahead. Thank you, Danielle and the panelists for an excellent discussion. Lots of uh, gratitude in the chat. This is a great discussion. Um, a lot of people again asking if this will be posted. It will. We'll try and have it up in the next couple of hours on our YouTube page and you can link to it to your social media. Let's get the word out. This has been a really eye-opening and an important discussion. Uh, we've not sorted next month's topic, but indeed we'll be back in November. So watch your inbox for that. A very special thank you again to our sponsor today, the Modern Miracle Network. We are the Canada Strong and Free Network. And if you appreciate and value the work we are doing, please consider a donation. Thank you everyone for joining us and we will see you back next month.